Hi folks, this is Jason. Hope oh, you're okay today. It's good to see you. Hope everybody's okay. I've been out in um, a town today around Manchester uh, doing street preaching today. Preached about three times and had a good time, so I hope you're okay. Uh, today, or tonight, we're going to have uh, a time in the Word of God. Uh, what I'm going to do tonight is uh, maybe a couple of videos tonight, or, but we're going to have a couple of hours, at least two hours, maybe three hours. We're going to look at what the gospel is, are we saved by grace, and then I'm going to try and defend the gospel, show you why the Christian faith is true, uh, and give you some evidences for that, and answer uh, some of the objections that might come um, against the faith. Okay, so that that's what I hope to do uh, today. Uh, I'll just get one or two things just ready. Uh, forgive me. I'll just see if it's here. Yeah, trusted old. Uh, <laughs> Good, uh, good book here that will help us later on. Okay, so I hope you're okay. I might put a few testimonies on later on. And uh, we'll have a good time. Um, feel free to use the video uh, if you're a Christian organization and you want to share the gospel. Uh, you can use the um, video. If you're an atheist organization, you don't have the permission to use it, I'm sorry, but no atheist organization has permission to use this video. If you see an atheist organization upload this video, some atheists have YouTube channels that are pretending to be me or trying to um, discredit me by, by uh, setting up um, their own channels and pretending that they're, they're my channels. Um, if you see this video and they've uploaded it, they don't have a right to do it, so you're welcome to um, DMCA them or whatever it is or flag them. Um, okay? Or any other group that's not, not preaching the Word of God, okay? I don't like to be like that, but I'm fine. I've found um, had a lot of harassment um, uh, from the atheist community online and I gave them the opportunity to use my videos and they've abused them rather than actually use them so so there we are but I'm not going to be mentioning the atheist again I don't want to get involved with them I do find that online they are troublemakers and they are bullies and you're better off staying away from them uh, okay okay let's come before the Lord Lord we just thank you for this day Lord we thank you for your love and we thank you for your grace and care and Lord we give you the prayers and we give you the glory and Lord I thank you that you are our God and you are our Saviour and our Lord and Lord I just give you the prayers today I give you the glory I give you the honour and Lord I thank you for this day in your name Amen I pray that you bless this message to our hearts I pray that we would really come to know you and know your love and know your grace Lord in your name Amen Amen so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to share the gospel for about an hour. Then I've got some notes uh, from various, um, I think this is from Wallace, there's about four notes here. Uh, it's very helpful. And I've got a book and uh, some uh, a toolkit that I use with, that I take out, street preaching. And what I'm going to do is, after I've preached the gospel, basically... I'm going to share with you 
um, why the gospel is the truth and answer some of the questions that you might have. Um, if you have any questions, um, feel free to write underneath the video. Uh, if, if you write honest questions, um, I'll take a look at the end of the at the end of the sermon, and um, I'll um, see what people are saying. And if you're asking for questions, then I'll uh, try and answer them. Okay. So feel free to ask your questions now. Um, in fact, if you want to make it interactive, there's four of you actually on online at the moment. Um, if you just wait there. Uh, sorry about this. Sorry about this. Yeah, if, if if one or two of you could just make comments now and then I can find where this is being hosted. So if one or two of you can just make comments now and then I'll be able to find where this is actually being hosted. Sorry about this, I'm just waiting for it to come up. Someone can message me on the channel. Maybe just let me know where where it's being hosted. It's because I didn't get the UCRL on it. Anyhow, I'll leave it to you, technical bots. There. If I can't find questions now, I'll try to answer tomorrow. Okay. So thank you so much for coming. Right, the passage that we're looking at is Ephesians chapter two, verse one to ten. I'm using the Old King James uh, tonight. Some of you might might have heard this before. If some of you were my fans out there, anyhow, Ephesians chapter two says. Uh, sorry about my hair. <laughs> Been out street preaching, so it's a bit messy. Don't worry about your hair, by the way. And you have he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. I mean, also we all had our conversations in time past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherein he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace have you been saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any one should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus into good works, which God had before ordained, that we should walk in there. So that's what we're looking at tonight. Um, hopefully, uh, those who want to keep, keep up what I'm doing, um, hopefully I'll be preaching in the morning and in the evening. Um, or doing a lecture in the morning or evening so if you want to catch what I'm doing you can come in this channel um, like I said no one has copyright on these videos they are my videos and they will be on normal YouTube license and I'll make it clear under my videos that from 
a few days ago no one has any permission to copy any of the videos and if you do copy um, people will be encouraged to flag you or or to complain okay okay so we're looking at Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 to 10 and it is uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith that this is not of yourselves it is the gift of God Christianity is different from religions and from atheism um, atheism is about you it's about what you can do it's about your abilities your intellectual abilities your your intellectual prowess or whatever religion is about what you can do but Christianity is about what God's done for you it's about his his mercy to you for it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves it is the gift of God Christianity is a gift of salvation and the gift is Jesus Christ it is a gift that God has given to you it's a free gift a free gift that you don't have to pay you don't have to do anything it's a free gift that God has given to you for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life God has given you his son Jesus Christ to die in your place so that you can live there's a hymn how willing was Jesus to die that we rebel, rebel sinners might live the life they could not take away how re ready was Jesus to give they pierced through his hands and his feet his body he freely resigned the pains of his flesh were so great but greater the pangs of his mind that's an old hymn but it perfectly demonstrates the gift of God was Christ who was in agony in taking your punishment for your sin now you might say well why is that why did he have to die and he had to die because he's holy he's a holy God and a holy God cannot allow sin in his presence and he must judge sin and if he was to judge you you would be lost so he sent his son to die in your place so first question are you spiritually dead imagine you was dead in a hospital on a hospital bed and imagine as you were dead outside next to your bed is a window and outside it's sunny and it's beautifully sunny and there are kids playing in the garden and there's someone playing a flute and it's beautiful sweet music but you're dead you can't hear the music you can't see the sun you can't see the children playing that's what it's like when we talk about Christianity to you you're dead spiritually no matter how much we argue with you no matter how much we debate with you you're dead you cannot hear the sound of God you cannot hear the sound of the Word of God yes you might be clever you might be able to win debates on YouTube you might be able to uh, trip Christian apology stuff and show their contradictions but you're dead and you can't hear the pulsating sound and joyous sound of the Word of God you can't see Christ you can't see God you're blind deaf and dumb to spiritual things as for you you were dead in your transgressions and sins Ephesians 1 1 as for you you were dead in your transgressions and sins until you realize that you're dead you're never going to become a liar Albert Barnes saw with the sinner in regard to the spiritual and eternal world he sees no beauty in religion he hears not the call of God he is unaffected by the dying of the Savior and he has no interest in eternal realities the reason why you're not interested in the Bible is not because you're clever the reason why you're not interested in the Bible you're, you're not interested in Jesus isn't is it's not because you're clever it's not because you're smart it's not because you've got all the arguments and can show that Christianity is not true the reason why you're not a Christian today is because you're spiritually dead it's because no matter what evidence is brought to you you're blind and you cannot see the kingdom of God Isaiah 9 2 the people 
walking in darkness have seen a great light, and those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Christ is the light. He's the light that gives us life. He's the light that opens our eyes. And until he opens your eyes, you're not going to see the truth. Then after the James chapter 1 15 says, Then after the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is when it is full grown, gives birth to death. I'll say that again. Then after the desire has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. What that's saying is that we see something, we desire something, then we then we follow it out and then it brings spiritual death. Our Lord said, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gorge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body then your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Matthew 5. I think it's Matthew 5 or Matthew 6. We'll just check. Matthew. Matthew, 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 Matthew. I'll just check because uh, I think it's five, yeah. Yeah, Matthew chapter five, verse twenty seven to thirty. And our Lord there is saying, Look, even if you just have one sexual thought you know, it's serious stuff from God's perspective. You know, and I don't think we realize that from God's perspective he's holy and our hearts are sinful. I don't want to just, I don't want to try and condemn you and, and say, oh, you're a wicked, vile person or anything like that. What I'm trying to get you to see is that God is holy and pure and he hates sin. He hates sin. And it grieves him when we sin. Have you heard the story of an American coach and um, one training day he threw a snake, a rattlesnake in a bag in the, um, in the uh, coach training room where, the, where his, his football team, it's an American football team. And they all got up and ran like the clappers, they ran as fast as they could. And he said, just as you've run away from that rattlesnake, run away from drugs and alcohol. And in a way, God wants you to run away from the things that are pulling you down. To realize that these things, that you're spiritually dead, that you're feeding your spiritually dead nature with things that are bringing you down. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death. If we sow sin, we will reap judgment. And God always does it. Every time he does it. Every time we do wrong, there's a judgment. One Peter chapter four, verse three and five: For you have spent enough time in the past doing what the pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give an account to him. Who is ready to judge the living and the dead? 1 Peter 4 3 5. God doesn't want us to live in debauchery. He doesn't want us to be involved in sexual immorality. He wants us to live for Him and, and, and follow Him. And God will judge us, and God chastises us, and God will judge us. So, are we spiritually dead? And if we are, then we're going to be coming alive. If we acknowledge that actually, I am a sinner, actually I am a sinner and I, and I need God, then you're halfway there. Number two, are you controlled by Satan? Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2, in which you used to live 
when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in the in those who are disobedient, Ephesians 2.2. 2. There is a spiritual dimension to life. There is there is a force behind this material world that's a demonic force that seeks to bring you down, that seeks to pull you down. And when you're debating a Christian and you're trying to pull their arguments down, there's something behind you. There's a Satan and there are dynamic, dynamic forces. 1 John chapter 3 verse 8 Who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. So you've got your own sin, but at the same time the devil's feeding your sin. So whenever you meet a Christian and you're supposed to be uh, thinking about Christ and the Christian's trying to get you to think about Jesus, there's always Satan behind you working, trying to stop you. So you might be talking to a Christian and they're trying to share the gospel and all you can think about is sex. That's the devil behind you, tempting you, warping your mind, trying to pull you away from listening to the truth. And we could go on a lot of scriptures about the devil. But to beat the devil, let's look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, 18. I meet a lot of young people in Manchester and around that are Satanists. They believe in Satan. And if you're a Satanist today, I've got to ask you, why are you a Satanist? How often? I've asked a, a few, quite a few Satanists, actually, who've come to me and we've had chats. And they've, I've said, why are you a Satanist? And not one Satanist, I kid you not, not one Satanist has ever given me any logical reason or any logical argument or any evidence for their beliefs. I said, do you believe the Bible? They say, no. So why do they believe in Satan? The answer that I get generally is basically, well, Satan's a good guy because he's always the one that's getting it in the net from God. Right. So... That that just doesn't make sense. If you're a Satanist, that does not make sense. You've got no evidence, and you've got no logical arguments for that. And I have met so many uh, so many Satanists that, when confronted with, "Have you got evidence?" and they haven't got any evidence, they just follow Satanism because their mates are following it. And I just want to ask you, as a Satanist, why are you following Satanism? Why are you involved in it? Because the devil's been defeated. The devil was defeated. Well, if we turn to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 and 18, Satan only wants to do you harm. But put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The devil's out to destroy your life. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of the world against spiritual wickedness in high places. The devil has his demons and they're wicked and they're out to destroy your life. So why is a Satanist? Are you into Satan when Satan wants to destroy your life? Wherefore take unto you the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. You gotta fight the devil because if you don't fight the devil he's gonna take you down and you have gotta put on the whole armour of God. It's a warfare. This is serious business. There's a war going on. And the war for your soul, the devil wants to take your life away and destroy it. He'll give you the drugs. He'll give you the sex. He'll give you the drink. He'll give you the money. He'll give you what you want so you can get on with your life and be happy. And if you're happy and you've got all you want and you don't need God, then he knows he's got you and you're going all the way down to hell. That's what he wants for you. And how many Satanists have I seen who've come to me I ask them to give me evidence. They don't give me any evidence. But when I look into their eyes, when I look at them, they seem very, very sad people. They don't seem very happy. So it says, Wherefore take unto you the whole armour of God. Stand therefore, having your loins about the truth. 
and having gone the breastplate of righteousness. So you need truth. The devil's not a truth teller. He's a liar. He'll tell you lies. Jesus is the truth. The word of God is the truth. And having on the breastplate of righteousness. We need Christ on. We need to put Christ's righteousness on. We can't stand before God in our own righteousness because they're filthy rags. We need the righteousness of Christ. If you're going to believe in the devil, the devil can't stand before God. He's got no righteousness. And your feet shed with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace, Jesus dying, will bring you peace. The devil will not bring you peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherein you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. We've got to have faith in Christ in, and in the word of God. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The word of God is the sword against the devil. The, the word of God is the spirit with the Spirit of God is the weapon to take on the demonic forces. Now some of you atheists will be laughing your heads off at the moment, think, thinking this all hilarious, that there is a devil and demonic forces and all the rest of it. But my friend, I can prove to you there's a devil. Get hold of your Bible and say to yourself, I'm going to take it seriously. I'm going to follow the Bible exactly as it says for a week. Read the Gospel of John and follow the Gospel of John for a week. And I tell you, as you follow the Gospel of John for a week as an atheist and really put it into practice, I kid you not, the demonic forces will come and they will do everything they can to stop you following Jesus. And you will know there is a devil. The devil also is out to bring condemnation. And he says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereon with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. We've got to be in prayer all the time because it's a warfare and the devil is trying to discourage us. So be at prayer. Put the weapons of God on, the armor of God. The, the whole picture there that Paul is using, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, the shield and the sword, it's a picture of a Roman soldier with his armor on. Don't forget Paul in Philippians was, at, was in jail and he was... Um, he was in change next to a Roman soldier. That's what they did. And so he would see a Roman soldier with his weaponry on all the time. And Paul uses that as an illustration. And basically, we're at war. And Satan's at war with you. He wants to destroy you. So if you're a Satanist, you're, you're, out to, you're following the wrong army. And the, that army will destroy you. You need to come over to the army of light in Jesus Christ and put on his full armor. The Word of God, faith, the Holy Spirit, you need to trust in God. Those who are skeptical about demonic forces and all the rest, I understand that because I was I was skeptical. But I realized there was a devil. When I started to follow Jesus and read the Bible and take it seriously, I began to see there was a devil because you will find, as soon as you do that, you the devil will come after you and he will try and stop you. And you will know then that there is a devil. All right? So I'm sorry for going on uh, quite a bit about that. But I do think a lot of young people I've met in, in my city, a lot of young people, in fact there are hundreds of them that congregate in, in my city and the towns around where I live. And they're Satanists. And I, and, and I hope that this is a help to you as a Satanist. Thirdly, are you under the wrath of God? We, we've looked, if we go back now, we, we're looking at the grace of God. We've looked at, are you spiritually dead? We've looked, are you controlled by Satan? And now we're looking at, are you under the wrath of God? He says, all of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature, here it is, objects of wrath, Ephesians 2, 3. We were by nature objects of wrath. I met a guy today and he said he'd been reading the Bible and he, he couldn't, he, he'd read it for a year and then when he finished it he put it down and he didn't want to read it again. And he felt he was very judgmental, that God was judging at the beginning and it seemed very, very hard. He says here... <coughs> 
aren't we by nature the objects of wrath? You can't have God in your own image. You, you, we, we, we can't have God like a little teddy bear. Oh, he's a gooey teddy bear, and we can just hug him, and he's our God, and we and he loves us, and we love him, and he's and he's all like a little teddy bear. God is not just a little. He's not a teddy bear. He's an awesome God. He's the creator of the universe. He's a mighty God, and you can't mess with God. You can't play around with a mighty God. And if we mess with sin, he will judge us. So what do you want? Do you want a God in your own image that you can just mold and do get him to do what you want? Or do you want a God who's independent and mighty? There is a wrath of God. Francis Schaeffer, one of the great Christian apologies, says, There is no real preaching of the Christian gospel except in the light of the fact that man is under the wrath of God. Man is under the wrath of God. Deuteronomy 28, 28, the Lord will afflict you with madness, blindness, and confusion of mind. Proverbs chapter 1, 27, I in turn will laugh at your disaster, I will mock when calamity overtakes you. Malachi 4, 1, surely the day is coming, it will burn like a furnace, all the arrogant and every evil doer will be stubble. And that day is coming, will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to, to them. God's a God of consuming fire. God's a God of wrath and a judgment. He's a God of love. He's a God of love. He's a God of mercy. And he's, a, he's a tender God. He's a wonderful God. But he's a God of wrath and he does not and will not turn the blind eye to sin. The gospel message, says John MacArthur, begins with a statement about the wrath of God. Frankly, that is diametrically opposed to most of our evangelistic techniques. Most of our contemporary evangelism purposely avoid the theme. A lot of churches today will not preach the wrath of God. A lot of churches today will not preach the wrath to come. And it's wrong. It's really bad. A church that will not preach the wrath of God is a church that is blind and is dying and perhaps even dead. You cannot understand the good news unless you know the bad news. Ephesians 5, 6, 5, 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Ephesians 5, 6. God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Romans 5, 9. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from what? From what? How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Romans 5, 9. The wrath of God is coming. The wrath of God is mighty. The wrath of God will crush you. It will. He will pulverize you. He'll take you and he'll put you in hell and you'll burn for a billion years if you would, if you mock him and if you turn your back on him and if you think he's nothing, then you're coming against the mighty God. God will judge. I'm sorry, but he will judge. He is a consuming fire. He is a holy God. He's a holy God and hates sin. He will not... Have sin in his presence. He will not have sin in his presence. He is an awesome God. You cannot tame this God to your own little image. You cannot tame him with your atheism. You cannot browbeat him with your atheism. You cannot browbeat him with your religion. You cannot browbeat him with your, with your sentimental religion. You cannot form this God into your image. You are up against the mighty one true and only God. The God of holiness, the God of consuming fire, the God who is mighty and glorious and powerful, the God who holds you in his hands, the God who holds this universe in his hands. The wrath of God is coming, my friend. He is a holy, holy God, pure and undefiled in glory and majesty and power and, and just deserves to be worshipped because of who he is. He's an awesome God and he hates sin. He hates sin with a passion. He cannot stand sin and he will 
obliterate sin wherever it's found, whether it be a little sin or a big sin. He is an awesome God. You said, Jay, I don't like it. I don't like you preaching like this. I don't like you talking about the wrath to come. I don't like you talking about God is wrath. My friend, I don't care what you like or what you don't like. It's what is true. Since when has like or not like been the test of truth? Just because you don't like something does not mean that it's not true. Just because you like something does not mean that it's true. What you like and what you dislike means nothing. Truth is truth. And the truth is God is a holy God. That's the truth. Matthew 13, 42, they will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. God is telling you out of his love that he is a holy God. That's what God is trying to do. He's trying to warn you. He's trying to warn you because he loves you. It's like a child. A child, imagine a child. And there's a burning burning fire of coal fire in the house and 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 the parents put a guard around it and the five-year-old child runs to the guard and wants to pull the guard away and jump into the fire the parents will grab the child and they'll shake the child and say what you're doing no no this is this is dangerous you're going into the fire what parent would let the child put the hand in the fire? Or what parent would just leave the five-year-old child to do what he wants and just go in the fire or near the fire? That wouldn't be a caring parent. God is showing you he is a caring parent because he's saying, fire, 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 fire. He's warning you and warning you and warning you. And you're looking at me as a preacher and saying, Jay, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. You're doing my head in. Holiness of God, mighty God, God of hell fire. I hate it, Jay. I can't stand what you're saying. But God's saying to you, fire, fire, fire. Avoid it, avoid it. 1 Peter chapter, I think. 5 verse 3 while people are saying peace and safety destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape Ooh, God's going to come and judge and then here's the good news that's been the difficult news but now we get the good news number four are you saved by grace Ephesians 2, 4. God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. God who is rich in mercy. Rich in mercy now. Okay. You heard me talk about the, rich, the wrath of God. But notice here who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. I'll read that again because it's so important. God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. He makes you alive. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. Excuse me. God shows his extravagant love and grace to us. Who were held deserving sinners shows his grace by coming down, taking upon himself human flesh and going to the cross where they whipped him, they nailed him to that cross and he took the full force of the wrath of God upon himself. It's a mystery. We can't fully understand it. But he took that full wrath and judgment for you. So that if you confess your sin, you will not go under the wrath of God, but you will escape it and come under the peace and banner of Jesus Christ. 
And that's what it means when he says, God who is rich in mercy. God who is rich, rich in mercy. Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 5. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 5. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought him us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. It's, it's a prophecy, a 400 year prophecy before Jesus was born that the Messiah would die. If you're a Muslim today, I've heard, I, I debate many Muslims and many Muslims say the Bible's been changed. First of all, I need to tell you that the Quran has changed. There is a, a hadith by Bukhari that tells you that Uthman burnt the Quran. Did you know that? And the Quran has been changed. Not a lot of Muslims know that, but that's the truth. But even that aside, this has not changed. The prophet Isaiah has not changed. And a 400-year prophecy tells you that Jesus Christ was to come and die on a cross for your sin as a Muslim. Now you as a Muslim might say, well, the Quran says that Jesus didn't die on a cross. Well, the prophet Isaiah says he did because he prophesied it. So as a Muslim, you've got to listen to the prophets. You say that you believe in the prophets. If you believe in the prophets, why don't you believe in the prophet Isaiah? If you say that Isaiah has changed, why would the Jews put a passage about the Messiah dying on a cross? Why would they do that? They don't believe the Messiah is to come and die on a cross. Your whole theory that the Bible's been changed is a silly idea. It just does not make sense. And your arguments that you use against the Bible can be turned around against you. And when you say the Bible's been changed, I could show you why the Quran has changed. And I give you an example about Uthman and how he burnt the Qurans and made a recension. It's in Bukhari, one of the great Hadith collectors. So you've got to be careful as a Muslim. I, every time I meet a Muslim, they always say the Bible's been changed. How would you like it as a Muslim if I said to you, the Quran's been changed? And when I've said that to Muslims, they've always said, ah, but the Quran hasn't changed, so it wouldn't bother me. Oh, wouldn't it? It would bother you when I provide the evidence that the Quran has changed. All right? We'll get more into that later on. But the point is this, as a Muslim, there is evidence that Jesus died on a cross. You say, what evidence? Tacitus, Roman historian, AD 20... Jewish historian Jew, uh, Josephus, A.D. 60. It's been scholarly debate whether the Josephus passage has been interpolated. Probably has been interpolated by a third century monk or maybe a little bit later. But most scholars would agree that that pit about Jesus dying on a cross under Pontius Pilate in Josephus is good Josephus. So we're on good scholarly ground and good solid evidence. You cannot win the argument as a Muslim and say that Jesus did not die on a cross. It can be historically verified, and as a Muslim, you must acknowledge that the Quran is wrong about Jesus dying on a cross. And as a Muslim, it's no good getting angry at me. It's no good getting upset with me. It's no good saying, I'm not having this, you say the Quran has changed. I'm not having this. It's no good getting upset with me. You profess to believe in the prophets, and I'm quoting the prophet Isaiah, so you are the one who's being arrogant against God. You are standing up against God. You are making God small because you are not listening to the prophet Isaiah. And the prophet Isaiah tells you, Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken, God sm sm stricken by God, smitten and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that was brought, what brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. And it's no good saying, well, how can God die on a cross? It's no good asking questions about the Trinity and all the rest. Because you, know, you know you can tie Christians in a knot. 
The fact of the matter is, the Bible says that Jesus died on a cross by the prophets and he died. Now what are you going to do about it? Because that contradicts the Quran and there's tons of evidence that Jesus did die on a cross. And Jesus died on that cross for you because no matter how much as a Muslim you try to get to heaven by doing good deeds, you're always going to be a sinner. You're always going to be in debt to God. And God paid your debt as a Muslim. And, and, and he paid it for you by sending Jesus to die on a cross for you. So as a Muslim, I beg you, I, I love you in Jesus, to really think about this. Really read the Angel of John. Really read the Bible. And, and not just take on board what people say, but read it and think about it. Because Jesus did die on that cross for you as a sinner. And don't react like an atheist. I meet many Muslims and I debate many Muslims and they debate me as an atheist. I very rarely meet a Muslim who debates me as a Muslim. I've never met or hardly ever met a Muslim who says, I am a Muslim, your Bible wrong, here's the Quran, this is what the Quran says. I've hardly ever met a Muslim who says that. What I do get is, I am Muslim, Bible changed. Right. That's what an atheist would say. That's an atheist argument. That's not an argument that a Muslim should be using. A Muslim who believes in the in the holy books of God should not be using an argument like that. And guess what? Your classical scholars of antiquity would not use that argument because they were not atheists. They were Muslim. People who wanted to submit to God. And that's not an argument that someone who wants to submit to God would use. So be consistent as a Muslim. Don't start saying the Bible has been changed. That's an atheist methodology. You as a Muslim, read the Bible on your knees and ask God to speak to you. And I'm telling you that God teaches that Jesus Christ died on a cross for your sin. I beg you to think about this as Muslims. Isaiah 54 verse 7 For a brief moment I abandon you but with deep compassion I will bring you back. That's what God wants to do with you. All of you. Muslim, atheist, whoever you are. Satanist. God wants to bring you back. He wants a relationship with you. This isn't about winning an argument on some blog show or, or YouTube show or making or uh, fighting militant atheism. This is not. This is bigger than that. This is about God wanting a relationship with you. That's what God wants. He wants a relationship with you. He wants you to draw you in. He wants to show you His love. He wants you to bring you bring you in into a relationship with Him. And He wants to show you compassion. He wants to say, if you've sinned, come home to Him. Come home to Him. He says, you are forgiving and good, O Lord, abounding in love to all who call to you. Psalm 86, verse 5. Jay, I've slept with my best mate's wife. Well, repent. Repent. Say, Lord, I'm sorry, and he will show mercy on you. He said, Jay, I've been stealing from work. I've been sneaking stuff out of the office, or I've been sneaking stuff out of the warehouse, taking it home and nicking it. Well, repent. And turn to Jesus and he'll forgive you. He said, Jay, I've been on drugs for 20 years. My body's emaciated. It's gone. It's destroyed. There's no hope for me, Jay. I'm just finished. I'm, I'm a piece of crap, mate. I'm, I'm gone. There's no hope for me in my life. He said, Lord, forgive me. I'm a sinner. And he'll come into your life. He'll give you a new life. He'll give you new hope. It's like water coming into your heart. It's like uh, the elixir of life. Imagine you, someone had a, a, a bottle of, of, of oil and that if you drunk it, if you, was, if you was dead, they put the oil in your mouth and then you came alive. That's what the Holy Spirit's like. You can be dead. You can be on drugs for 20 years. You can be dead for, for being on drugs 20 years. You can be dead as a prostitute. You've had men enter you. Year in, year out, week in, week out, every day, men have been paying you and been sleeping with you as a prostitute. And you've been like that for years and you're numb, you can't feel love, you don't feel any man could ever love you and your, your heart is dead. And you feel that nobody loves you, nobody cares. 
and your heart could be dead. But the moment you believe in Jesus Christ, all things become new. He'll give you a new heart. He'll give you a new hope. He'll give you a new vision. He'll set you free as a prostitute. He'll give you forgiveness and peace and joy. He'll give you a heart that will melt where you can love again. And he'll bring people into your life that will love you. That's what God can do, but you do it because you want God. You want to know God. And if, if you do that as a prostitute, he'll, he'll show his mercy and love to you. He loves you so much. You said, Jay, I've slept with thousands of men. Jesus died for you, my friend. He loved you. He gave his life for you. And he wants you to have that relationship. You said, Jay, even me, even me who slept with so many men. Yes, you. He loved you. He gave himself for you. He poured his life out for you at the cross. And he wants you to come home. Come home to him. Come to me, all you who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And Christ says to you, come, believe in me, trust in me, and he, and he will forgive you. My dear friend, if you're a prostitute today and you're, you're living in a, in a world where you feel there is no hope, and you feel it's so bleak and dark and hopeless, I want to tell you that Jesus loves you and he wants you to come home and you can. You just say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Have mercy upon me. And at that moment, if you say, come into my life, he will come and he will wash you and he'll cleanse you and he'll make you anew. I don't care what you've done. He'll forgive you and cleanse you. Or if you're a, a, a drug addict and you've been on drugs for years, I probably don't fully understand why you're on drugs, but I got us some understanding. Maybe it's to hide that pain. Maybe you're hiding that pain. There's been a pain in your life. Somebody's done something to you when you were a child. Somebody's done something to you when you were a child and let you down as a child and you're taking the drugs and the drugs are numbing the pain. You don't have to think about the pain. You don't have to think about the worry. You don't have to think about the hurt. And as you take the drugs and you bury yourself and take to take away that pain, all the time you're taking those drugs, you are emaciating and destroying your body. And God's heart's bleeding as he sees you do that. It's bleeding as he sees you destroy your life. And God aches for you and longs for you to come home. He longs for you to know that you're not in darkness. There is, there is hope that he does care for you, that you don't have to live like that. You don't have to be in the pain on your own, that he'll carry the pain, that he'll carry you through that pain. He'll carry you and he'll, he'll be there for you. That's what he wants to do for you, to carry you in your pain, to take away that sense of hopelessness to show you that he is with you. That's what he wants for you. That's what he wants for you, my friend. So if you're on drugs today, please, please listen to Jesus. Listen to what he has to offer you. He said, Jay, why, why are you looking at me like that? I'm looking at you like that because you're special. Because you're so special. You're so special to God. And he wants you to come home. And I ask you that you would come home. Come home to him and believe in him. And then it says, Psalm 103, verse 8, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. Psalm 103, verse 8, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. Psalm 103, verse 8, The Lord is compassionate. He is a compassionate God, and he's gracious, and he's slow to anger and abounding in love. Do you see, my friends, that I'm trying to be a true preacher? Do you get that now? Do you understand that now? Do you say, The old preachers used to say to wound and to heal. Do you understand what true preaching is? To preach the full counsel of God. I preach the wrath of God, but I preach the tenderness of God and the love of God. And the two go together, and the church often preaches the love of God, but will not preach the wrath of God. Then you have these crazy dudes on YouTube who preach shock and awe, wrath all the time, and they do a disservice to God. They make him sound a monster. 
But if you're preaching the wrath of God, you've got to preach the tenderness of God and the two go together. That's balanced true preaching for you, my friend. Open your eyes and see what sound preaching is. Titus 3, chapter 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 4 and 7. But with the kindness and love of God, our Savior appeared. He saved us not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy he saved us through washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we might become the heirs having the hope of eternal life. There is so much there, isn't there? But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior appeared, there is a God, and He comes and He appears. He saved us, not because of, of righteous things we have done, but because of the mercy He saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit, the renewal of the Holy Spirit. Being poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. There's so much in that. I think there's, there's a few bits that I like. I like that. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior appeared. And he is appearing to you today. And he wants you to know his love. And the Holy Spirit. When you believe in Christ. The Holy Spirit comes and dwells in your heart. You get a new nature. God comes and gives you a new nature. Bear with me, and I, just bear with me a minute, in Luke chapter 15, if you have a Bible. This is one of my favorite stories in the Bible, Luke chapter 15. It's in the old King James, so bear with it if, it if it jars on your mind because you're not used to the old King James language, but bear with it. Luke 15, you're doing well. Luke 15, 11 to 31. But read this story because I love it. And he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. When he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him unto his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. When he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. And I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servant, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found and they began to be merry I love this story the prodigal son is a picture of you and me the prodigal son said to his father I'm going give me my inheritance and he went off and he had a good time and he had a riotous time and he probably slept around and then he had a famine and he had no money left and he was even feeding off the husks of the pigs. He'd got to rock bottom and then he realized the best thing to do is go back to his father. He goes back to his father and his father grabbed him, put a ring on his finger, put a robe on him. But let me just tell you about Jewish culture. If a son said to his father, give me my inheritance then went off and spent his inheritance it would be the equivalent of slapping the father in the face and it would be a public disgrace so when that son would come back 
everyone in the village would have come out and beaten up the boy, would have thrown things at the boy, would have attacked the boy. They would have run him out of the village because he would have been seen as a disgrace. But here, the father doesn't do that. The father runs to the son, puts a ring on his finger, puts a robe on him, and kills the fatted calf. You and I deserve to go to hell. But when we come to God and say, Lord, forgive me, I've sinned. God does not come to condemn us, but he runs to us. And he clothes us in his son, Jesus Christ. He makes us sons and daughters of the living God. He wraps his love upon us and pours out his Holy Spirit on us. And he gives us a new life. That's what God wants for you. And so God wants you to come home. He's not going to judge you. Just come and find that forgiveness and peace today. That's what he wants for you, my friend. Ephesians 2.8 For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can be justified, so no one can boast. People like to boast, but you can't boast with God. You see, my message to you is this. God has done your salvation for you. You've just got to believe. Okay? You've just got to believe. Ephesians 2, 6, 7. And God raised up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in the kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Why has God saved you if you've come to know Jesus today? So that God can be glorified by demonstrating his great mercy to you. Will you do that today? I'm asking you today, I'm going to give you a moment's quiet. I'm just going to be quiet right now. And I ask you to commit your life to God. I'm going to play some music just for a second. I'll, I can only play a minute. I've got to be careful. Uh, I think, um, what's his name? Uh, John Piper's Desiring God's let you use their stuff. So. So I'm going to play a song. And maybe this maybe this message has, has cut you up. While this music on, just in your moment, quiet moment now, just think about your journey, where your life is now, where you're going now. Think about what I've said to you and come home to God. Say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Let God minister to you now. Then when the song's finished, we'll finish off with the last bit of this message. It's only a few seconds. And then we'll go into some apologetics, answering questions that people have. But please, we Become a Christian today. Commit your life to Jesus. Will you do that? All you've got to do is a prayer. And I'll say a prayer as the music plays. I come, I come. It's to the Lord. The one who's broken. The one who's torn. Lord, I don't fully understand what Jay preached, but I know it touched me. Lord, I confess my sin. I acknowledge my guilt. I pray that you forgive me. And I pray that today you come into my life by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord. At this point, Lord, I hand my life to you. And I'm yours forever. Use me for your glory, Lord. I confess all sin and trust in you today. Amen. If you've done that prayer, then God will come and you would have been born again.
fish Sing a song See the wine is all My heart flesh may fail The earth will all give away But with my eyes With my eyes I see the Lord Lifted high on that day Behold the Lamb that was slain And I'll know that every tear was worth it all And though you stay me Yet I will praise you Oh, you saved from me. The wine is all Come, come and trust him. Come and give your life to him today. I don't care if you failed him, come and trust. Bow the knee. Come if you can't repent. Come if you feel unworthy. Come and believe in the Lord today. He wants you. Though your skin be a scarlet, sin will be a scarlet. They shall be white as snow. Amen. Not only is all your affliction momentary, not only is all your affliction light in comparison to eternity and the glory there, but all of it is totally meaningful. Every millisecond of your pain from the fallen nature or fallen man every millisecond of your misery in the path of obedience is producing a peculiar glory you will get because of that I don't care if it was cancer or criticism I don't care if it was slander or sickness it wasn't meaningless. It's doing something. It's not meaningless. Of course you can't see what it's doing. Don't look to what it's seen. When your mom dies, when your kid dies, when you've got cancer at 40, when a car careens the sidewalk and takes her out. Don't say, it's meaningless. It's not. It's working for you an eternal weight of glory. Therefore, therefore, do not lose heart. But take these truths and day by day focus on them. Preach them to yourself every morning. Get alone with God and preach His Word into your mind until your heart sings with confidence that you are new and cared for. Though you slay me, yet I will praise you. Though you take from me, I will bless your name. Though you rule with me, still I will worship. Sing a song to the one who's all mine. I'll sing a song to the one who's all mine.